now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, Finance Minister Matthias Cormann live on the show from Canberra to explain his latest $2 billion pitch to small business. Brexit or Brino, what deal does British Prime Minister Theresa May have on the table for Cabinet sign-off? We go live to London for market reaction with David Buick. And Chemist Warehouse on a roll with another strong singles day and a float perhaps in the offing. Chief reporter Leo Shanahan talks with Nancy Jian, who runs Chemist Warehouse's China division out of Shanghai. Well, yes, Santa has his ridings in, riding instructions from government to give small business a big share of the present swag. Government today building on its small business tax cuts and has revealed a new stimulus package for small business uh, ahead of the election. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg will launch a $2 billion government-backed intervention into the small and medium-sized business lending market. The Australian Business Securitisation Fund will be created to buy bonds that are then sold to investors by regional and non-bank lenders. The idea is that it would lower the cost of borrowing for smaller businesses by tackling a lack of competition and inflated interest rates. And the government will also encourage an Australian business growth fund. Well, the market failure is that we don't have a very developed securitisation market. Uh, and that is important in ensuring uh, that small business get access to finance from these smaller lenders and from uh, some of the smaller banks, because the banks really have the market cornered. Well, the Treasurer there, but joining me for more, the Minister for Finance and Leader of Government in the Senate, Matthias Gorman. He joins me live from our Canberra studio. Uh, Minister, welcome there. Before we go to this uh, new initiative, uh, you must be a pretty ha happy sound groper having got that GST through the Senate this afternoon. Uh, very happy. It's a great day for Western Australia and it's a great day for Australia. The uh, GST sharing arrangements uh, were broken. Uh, they needed to be fixed uh, and of course we put forward uh, a plan uh, to make the GST sharing arrangements fairer for Western Australia in a way that is good for national economic growth and which uh, is fair to every other state in that it leaves mm. every other state better off. So it was good to have that unanimously legislated uh, or passed through the Senate uh, today, yes. All right, let's move to the $2 billion uh, small business pitch you've got. Now, uh, it's very interesting, mixed reviews, I think, on whether this is actually the right way of fixing lending to small business, Matthias. Well, we obviously believe it's uh, the right way. I mean, we've very carefully considered all of the uh, options and, you know, what, you know, everybody knows what the problem is. Small business finds it uh, difficult to access uh, finance other than on the basis of a secured uh, loan typically uh, by uh, putting up their family home and even then uh, the uh, experience in the market is that the cost of uh, financing uh, is higher than what it, what it should be. So yeah. uh, what we are proposing to do here is by uh, putting uh, two billion dollars uh, of um, uh, funds forward uh, to uh, be administered uh, through the uh, Australian Office of Financial Management as part of uh, the securitization uh, fund mm. uh, is uh, not, not to directly lend to small business uh, but uh, to uh, provide more liquidity, uh, more depth uh, and uh, you know, into the securitization uh, market in order yeah. to uh, facilitate stronger competition in the small business lending market. So, so you've certainly got the support of Cosboa there and indeed uh, uh, Kate Carnell, the small business ombudsman. Uh, my colleague at the Australian, John Jury, calls this populist rubbish. Um, and, and uh, of the critics, uh, the concern seems to be that the problem is the current risk weighting uh, that banks, big and small, have to lend to small business. Why not just get APRA to look at changing the risk weighting? Well, you know, he, he is entitled to uh, his opinion. Uh, we very he's carefully not, not considered alone. all of the options. <laughs> Well, well, you know, in the end, uh, it's our job to make judgments uh, on uh, the right way forward. Uh, we have identified a problem for small business. We've come up uh, with a solution. There clearly is a market failure here because we don't have a sufficiently developed uh, securitization market uh, in this space with uh, sufficient liquidity or depth. Uh, the government uh, is uh, in a very sensible fashion able uh, to uh, support uh, competition in that market, uh, which uh, but, but will lead to of regulation, increase small business lending. It? Well, it's, 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 it, it provides, it, it, it deals, it addresses 
uh, market uh, failure in the securitization market in this in this part of the market and what it, what it will do is it will help facilitate uh, access uh, for small business uh, to uh, debt financing uh, it will do so at uh, more competitive uh, prices and, and you know over time uh, th this will lead to a uh, securitization market that is more liquid that has more depth and it will uh, ensure that small banks and uh, non-bank lenders uh, yeah. will be in a position to better compete uh, with the bigger banks. Two billion committed by government uh, towards this. Uh, does, it, do, does government have any risk? Well, you know, obviously, we are, this is administered uh, by the Australian Office of uh, Financial Management, which incidentally has got experience in this. I mean, they've uh, previously uh, operated uh, in this space. Uh, in you know, most re in the context in 2008. Uh, of uh, the government's response to the global financial uh, crisis in terms mm. of residential uh, mortgage-backed uh, securities. And so, I mean, th there, is, there is a precedent here. It will be done with the appropriate levels of due diligence. The government is not providing any loans to business directly. Uh, what we're doing is providing additional uh, support uh, through uh, to the uh, securitization market uh, through yes. through this mechanism and it, it will it will provide more depth to that market it will provide more liquidity uh, yeah. it will facilitate competition from smaller banks and non-bank oh. lenders and it will uh, yeah. help uh, get help small business get access to financing uh, yeah. at more competitive B prices business lending has been growing in in the small business the big small business lender uh, NAB now uh, some people would say well the, the government's bank levy actually took some uh, liquidity liquidity out of the market anyway. I'm just wondering, would you rule out now, Minister, any further raising of the bank levy because the shadow treasurer, Chris Bowen, has done so? Uh, well, you know, obviously we have already uh, legislated the major bank levy. We've uh, made very clear that, uh, you know, that, that was it. That was our position. I mean, we have got absolutely no plans to revisit uh, the major uh, bank levy. I mean, it's been legislated. That's it. Okay. But you won't rule it out? Well, what do you mean? I've just told you that we have absolutely no plans to revisit okay. the major bank levy. It's been legislated and that's our policy position. All right. More broadly, the level of government intervention at the moment, Matthias Cormann, foreign ownership, bank levies, price cap threats in retail electricity, threats of breaking up company. Peter Coleman, uh, who runs Woodside, uh, yesterday at the Mining Club, was saying, where is the, the leadership in this country? Where's the vision? Where's the policy beyond the election? Well, you know, as a result of the plan that we have implemented over the last five years, our economic growth is stronger, our employment growth is much stronger, uh, and our budget position uh, is on an improving uh, trajectory. I mean, when we came into government in 2013, you've got to remember the economy was weakening, unemployment was rising, and yeah. the budget position was rapidly deteriorating. Now, Where's the plan we have going forward beyond I've intervention? Well, you know, we are pursuing a very ambitious free trade agenda, uh, you know, continuing to position Australia as an open uh, trading uh, economy committed mm. uh, to uh, you know, free, free trade and access to you know, mm. open market access. You mentioned, foreign, you, you mentioned foreign investment. I mean, we're, we're yep. committed to foreign investment, but, but foreign right. investment is so important to Australia that we need to ensure that the regulatory framework is yep. such that public continues to have confidence that when there is a proposal that is contrary to the national interest, it will not proceed. If we didn't have a regulatory system in place like that, it would actually undermine uh, foreign investment into the future. Okay. Minister, you mentioned free trade there. The free trade deal with Indonesia appears to be uh, on ice at the moment. Hasn't the announcement to consider moving the Australian Embassy to Jerusalem right in the middle of the Wentworth by-election been a rather costly stunt? Well, I, I don't agree at all that it's on ice. It's, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, the um, agreement uh, in relation to the um, Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement was uh, substantively concluded uh, on the 31st of August uh, with President Widodo and uh, Prime Minister uh, Morrison confirming the substantial conclusion of, uh, of, of that agreement. But as is always the case, there is a process now on the way to finalize the text in both languages of the mm. uh, treaty text. All the I's have got to be dotted and the T's got to be crossed. That is the usual process and both sides are committed. Uh, so to, you, you don't uh, see this as a costly stunt, this, uh, th this announcement that, was, that, that actually occurred in the middle of the Wentworth by-election? I, I, I completely reject that characterization out of hand. Uh, Australia is uh, not only entitled to, we uh, have a responsibility uh, to assess uh, policy matters uh, you know, in the national interest, and that is what we're doing uh, in relation uh, to uh, the matter of the Australian Embassy right. uh, for, uh, to Israel. And, and yes. I mean, that is, that is, of course, that is our job as a national government. Uh, we, we are not conflating those two issues. 
Can I move to negative gearing? Now, uh, obviously, we've got uh, Labour's reforms there on the table. News polls show that Australians still think Labour has a better, better policy in relation to housing affordability, 47 to 33. Uh, now, Chris Bowen, when I spoke to him last the trend, week... The trend is our friend. The trend <laughs> you, is our friend. It's heading in the right direction. We've well, got to just slowly keep, we've got to keep talking. Chris Bowen says it's a good time well. to do this reform because the market is actually coming off and there are actually less people in the market. Why won't you consider uh, that it's actually a good idea? Well, it's because it's a bad idea. I mean, all, I mean, you know, Chris Bowen is just coming up with fancy language to whack Australian families with a higher tax. I mean, all this is about is, uh, is about increasing uh, the uh, personal income uh, tax uh, payment of hardworking Australian families. Might Whatever way he wants to dress this up. Well, you know, what, what is negative gearing? Negative gearing uh, is uh, working Australians leveraging their existing income and the existing value of their existing assets to invest uh, in uh, new, either uh, you know, income producing or capital uh, appreciating uh, assets. I mean, this is, I mean, this, this is about uh, working Australians being able to deduct the costs incurred in generating additional income or generating uh, additional capital appreciation. Capital appreciation, which of, which of course is tax. Uh, once uh, capital gains is realised. So, I mean, it's bad economic policy. Uh, we don't support it. Uh, you know, uh, Bill Shorten and Chris Bowen can go to the next election telling Australians that they will increase All taxes right. by $200 billion over the next decade, which they are. Our point is that would harm the economy, it would put jobs at risk, and it would hurt uh, working Australians. We'll see how the trend goes. I'm sure there'll be a few rounds on this. Minister, I thank you so much for your time. Always good to talk to you. Now, after the break, Chemist Warehouse was one of the top winners at Alibaba's single day over the weekend. More on that next with Your Money Chief Business Reporter, Leo Shanahan. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, Alibaba's Singles Day, one of the world's biggest annual online shopping events, racked up another groundbreaking figure over the weekend with over $30 billion in sales recorded, according to Forbes. That's more than Black Friday, which is coming up again, and Cyber Monday combined at times two. Aussie businesses shone bright at the event with vitamin producer Suisse taking out the top imported cross-border brand into China this year. And this year's number one cross-border business was again our very own Chemist Warehouse, who we've heard today might be considering a 2019 IPO. Well, your money chief business reporter Leo Shanahan was there on the ground at the event over the weekend. Leo, what was it like? Well, it was hugely interesting. Yeah. It was kind of weird, I gotta say. I mean, I did have to remind myself that I was in a large electronic version of those weirdos who used to line up at Boxing Day and, yeah. you know, bash down the doors. But just the volume. I mean, you spoke to Maggie Joe, obviously, from Alibaba, but the volume that goes yeah. through. Yeah, I mean, I was just writing a piece to the website about it, and it was, you know, I was just saying that it's like small countries' GDPs just flicking past my eyes in about 30 seconds. As soon as right. it hit midnight, they were over... Uh, there are over about 10 billion US within about half an hour. Within the first 10 minutes, they were over, uh, you know, 7 billion. Yeah. Uh, it was just incredible. And as you said, that volume is 30 billion US. There's not 30 billion Australian. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and Chemist Warehouse. Yeah, Chemist Warehouse. Look, I spoke to, uh, to the head of China, uh, Chemist Warehouse. Uh, they're such an integral part. China is such an integral part of their business in terms of, you know, those products, vitamins, uh, baby yeah. formula. And, and, and tying up with Alibaba really closely, obviously. Is yeah, it's one of these cross-border companies. Now, just to clarify, uh, Chemist Warehouse weren't number one international company. That's yeah. obviously, you know, the Panasonics, the Apples, the Samsungs. But these are these are the basically smaller businesses that only that do business out of their, out of their home country. And then there's cross-border allowance for them to do business in China through, through the Timor application. And it's incredible what a, what a door this opens for these businesses uh, this I was there the same week of course that there was the uh, import uh, expo that oh, yes, uh, yes. President Xi spoke at so it was a huge week in Shanghai and uh, it was conspicuously unpolluted uh, for a couple of days until the factories were allowed to turn on again yeah. uh, and cars <laughs> allowed to drive at, uh, the pool. <laughs> right. Did you notice a lot of other Aussie companies over the radar? Yeah, look, there's obviously the Swiss who were yeah. number one yeah. uh, and uh, there was uh, different, there's obviously the focus is on uh, on health, baby yeah. products and... Uh, Jessica Rudd up there? Jessica Rudd, I caught up with Jessica Rudd. Now yeah. she's just signed a new deal with her company, eCargo, which, well, 
Cargo bought out her company, which yeah. has now bought out uh, Metcash in China. So they're uh, now in a new agreement in China. So that's yeah. exciting for her. Yeah, I think uh, so a lot of Capilano honey might be going up there with her this, husband yeah. Yeah, eyeing off Capilano, yeah, right? Well, there's a huge amount and it's of business going on there. Uh, you know, Sea Folly or another company I caught up with briefly who uh, were oh, in, in a swimwear company. That's don't have much of an impact, uh, sorry, footprint in China, but, you know, early on they were quite happy with uh, the sales they were showing that day because yeah. uh, that's a higher-end kind of sea uh, uh, swimwear market. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. That uh, sounded like a really good trip. Yeah. Uh, and Leo spoke with Nancy Jian, Chief Operating Officer of Chemist Warehouse's China division on the sidelines of Alibaba's Singles Day event in Shanghai. Here she is. Nancy Jiang, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Now, uh, look, I'm interested, firstly, the importance of this weekend uh, for Chemist Warehouse, but also the importance of Alibaba more generally uh, for your company. Well, we we started like China was our first step into the international market. We started joining. We had an exclusive agreement with um, Timo Global with Alibaba since 2015. This is actually our fourth singles day, you know, in our China journey, in our international journey. We're very excited, you know. This singles day festival is like is like what everyone is looking forward to every single year. So this week is a big week for us. It has been a, it has been a very quick 12 months, and we're very excited. I understand you're actually the well by sales the most successful Australian company uh, with uh, on on this weekend. What kind of products are you, do you sell, and what are the what are the most popular? So Chemist Warehouse is the biggest overseas merchant on Timor Global at the moment in the cross-border industry. Uh, you know we are very popular. Like like a lot of a lot of people like our like our vitamins especially. It's vitamin supplement because of the standard of Australia products. That's why all, a lot of Chinese actually love it. You know. Um, skincare products and also baby and mom and bobs um, and personal care they are all our strength but the biggest strength is, has always been vitamins and skincare yeah. especially would that be the trend that maintains this weekend do you think I think you know China, like China market grows and move very fast you know since 2000 like from 2015 we see the supplements being the biggest category but it's kind of shift you know it shift towards the more younger generation skincare become more popular but we still believe this year this single day vitamin will still be our strength yeah and what about uh, talk of recent restriction on importing of let's say ba baby form formula uh, exporting to to China does that concern you I think as a retailer, from a retailer perspective, we are more concerned for the suppliers, yeah. from the manufacturers. But however, I spoke to a couple of suppliers. I don't think it is a major issue for them. Everyone is working through it. And I believe with what the presidency actually say in his speech, I think cross-border industry will continue to grow and China will make it happen. It makes the business so much easier in China. Yeah, well, on that subject, obviously, President Xi gave a big speech this week. Uh, Australian uh, exporters are generally concerned also about new, talking about new restrictions around labelling uh, in the Chinese market. Will that affect you at all? Are you concerned? I think for cross-border e-commerce, it makes the it makes the business in China a lot easier compared to the labeling side. Yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, the labeling is more for the general imports. Uh, cross-border uh, e-commerce has a lot of exclusion on this, mm -hmm. on this, and and we believe that um, you know from from what was said by the presidency, he will make the process a lot easier. He will reduce the tax as well. We're really looking forward to that. Yeah. Now I know uh, you're not a you're, you're not an international commentator, but uh, also there's a lot of talk. Of, obviously, there's the concern around trade war between uh, the U.S. and China. Uh, does that does that affect your thinking at all, or you just you just keep going as is? I think you know from from the, as as an overseas merchant, you know we really don't want to get into the political side. Yeah. But however, I think I think if the demand is there. You know, the sales will be there. You know, people in China, they all want to live, look, feel well. You know, I think Chemist Warehouse has the potential to bring that to China. So I think, you know, as long as the demand is there, customers love us, you know, the, I think this industry will continue to grow. Yeah. And what, what, are, what about other Australian companies? How important do you think Alibaba uh, is uh, weekends like this uh, for Australian companies? What are the problems you're encountering for them to enter, enter the market and who, who's succeeding? 
Besides yourself, obviously. <laughs> I think this is the tenth year for for Timo for Singles Day, yeah. and you know we believe that you know like Alibaba has brought a lot of value to to this cross border industry, and not only that, all the imports you know that is talked by the presidency, encouraged by presidency. Um, you know this is our this is actually our fourth year Singles Day. We we see a lot of brands like even big brands like you know Swiss, Blackmores, you know Bio Island, you know Goat, um, Eron, you know all these brands like. It, it doesn't matter whether they are big or small. The demand is always there and it's definitely growing. So this is an opportunity. If you want to get into China easier, Alibaba is your, is your easier option. Great pitch there. After the break, UK Prime Minister Theresa May is expected to call her ministers later today that it is make or break for avoiding a chaotic exit from the EU. We'll get the latest from BGC's David Buick in London next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Could this be the turning point? The smoke signals coming out of number 10 overnight are hinting that British PM Theresa May just might have the support in her cabinet, at least for the 500-page agreement which the EU has been sweating over, or, or bureaucrats have, uh, British and European for weeks now. A tweet from the Sun's political editor has, Cabinet sources say May's pivotal five senior ministers, Rob Hunt, Javid, Gove and Cox will back it. Who knows, each of these key ministers had one-on-one -on -one meetings with the Prime Minister on Tuesday night to shore up her position. Any one of these resignations could threaten Mrs May's own leadership if they were to resign and perhaps stand against her. The great known unknown, to borrow from Mr Rumsfeld, is what the fine print, fine print actually says about the backstop, which would be agreed around how Northern Ireland would be treated. Two issues seem to be emerging. The first, if the UK does agree a Brexit withdrawal for March 31, where it moves into this transition period until December 2020, still in the customs union under EU, tra EU trade rules, then who decides what happens after the transition, where presumably Britain can trade outside the customs Union? If the answer is that Britain unilaterally decides this, then OK. But if that decision in 2020 has to be agreed with the EU again, and if the arbiter ends up being the European Court of Justice, well, that's not going to fly with the Brexiteers. The EJC is why they wanted to get out in the first place. Secondly, what about the soft Irish border between the North and the South? Well, Robert Peston in The Spectator uh, write, writes that Northern Ireland going forward would not be part of the customs union, but also not be quite the same as Britain and still be under some European trading rules. Now, that might put a faint line down through the Irish Sea. What will the DUP, the party in Northern Ireland propping up the May government, think of that? It is bizarre. Take the two Johnson brothers. Boris Johnson, chief Brexiteer, who's already come out this morning saying the deal leaves Britain as a vassal state to Europe, and Joe Johnson, his brother, actually a Remainer, who also resigned from the May cabinet recently for pretty much the same reason, that Britain would be powerless and worse off than before the referendum. Brexit becomes Brino. Brexit in name only. If Mrs May gets cabinet support, it will be because Tory Remainers would rather have her than a Brexiteer leader. And this is where perhaps she and her brilliant Brexit negotiator and Europhile Ollie Robbins have been so clever. Preparations for a hard Brexit, money that should have been spent to show that Britain meant leave means leave, were never spent. But if Cabinet does support her, the agreement needs European Council approval at the end of the month and then, crucially, it needs to be signed off by the British Parliament. Lord Haig, when he was out here a couple of weeks ago, told me the chances of that all happening was about 50%. I see he's now telling Remainers to prepare for a hard Brexit. Well, the Lowy Institute had a discussion on all of this today. The Lowy's Alex Oliver chaired a panel with Dr. Anne-Marie Elijah at ANU and Lowy's uh, Herbert uh, Lemanhu and me earlier today. In the beginning, we, we often assumed that uh, Britain would, be, uh, would present a very united front in the negotiations um, and that uh, the potential for internal divisions and squabbling um, lay almost exclusively on the European side, on the continental side, because you were dealing with 28, 27 sorry, uh, member states. Um, but uh, Michel Barnier has done a very good job and was empowered with a strong mandate um, um, to uh, forge a united line, and they've kept their word. They've, they've, they've uh, remained very cohesive. Um, 
as we move into um, negotiations about the future trade relationship with the UK, you might see more divisions between uh, member states that are more exposed in terms of their trade portfolio with the UK um, and those that are less exposed and along ideological lines as well. Uh, Macron and Merkel, who are both uh, sort of embattled at home, really need to prove a point here, which is that um, the European project is more than just economics um, and they're willing to incur economic costs uh, for the sake of um, proving a political point, which is the sanctity of the single market and the four freedoms, the, the, the freedom of movement of people in particular. Um, so I think those sorts of issues may actually start rearing their heads more in, coming, uh, in the coming months and years, um, and, and that you might potentially find a more divided uh, EU. The other, the other point about the EU, um, I think, is that they, you know, we, we sort of think that, well, Theresa May has had to concede pretty much all uh, along uh, to the Brussels line, and that's true. There's been a power imbalance between the EU and Britain. Um, all along, but they, they do appear to have conceded a, a pretty significant point, which was that Theresa May said, no, there can be no Northern Ireland or Northern Irish backstop. It has to be a UK-wide backstop. For a lot of European member states, there is a, an, a concern, therefore, that actually that backstop um, is a sort of de facto free trade agreement um, with the UK before we've even gotten to that point in the negotiations. So whereas it's viewed with a lot of scepticism in Britain, it's also viewed with a degree of scepticism in, in Europe. Now, coming back to the British question, um, there, it's true, I'm absolutely in agreement with Tiki there, there seems to be a sort of a, a perfect storm or an alignment all of a sudden between uh, the hardcore Brexiteers uh, Boris and, and the Remainers, Joe, the Johnson brothers, um, in that both are agreed that Theresa May's plan uh, is highly flawed and um, it, it presents a, a really bad alternative for, for the UK. They're disagreed about uh, the future, um, but they are agreed on the point that Theresa May isn't uh, providing uh, the answers there. Um, and that's very curious, and it does look as if um, uh, Theresa May's numbers in both in her cabinet and in Parliament are very precarious. Um, but I will say Theresa May, to her credit, has proven to be an enormous political survivor. I mean, she got out of a, a general election. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, has, at every twist and turn, despite the chronic weakness, or perhaps in spite of her weakness, because no one has dared to rock the boat, because the consequences of that within the Tory party would, be, would have been severe, yeah. um, she has proven to be the survivor. And she may now well play the scare tactic card very well, in the sense that neither the Remainers nor the Leavers would be happy with her plan, but they accept that the alternative, which is the precipice of the no-deal scenario, yeah. is so bad um, has so much uncertainty, would incur so much disruption that you have to stick with her plan. But if you believe the conspiracy theories, you'd say, and again, this is sort of an Ollie, Ollie Robbins driven thing, which is, I mean, he was back in Oxford doing European studies right from the, from the, from the get-go, so he's a great Europhile. Um, and he, uh, you, you know, if, if they were going to negotiate this in a, in a tough way, let's forget all the division between, within the British Parliament, uh, they would have actually put some money down on no deal, hard Brexit, you know, they would they would have spent some money to show, yeah, we're prepared to go that way. Uh, that, you know, they, they, they did not do that. And I think um, we're now in a situation where it is actually very difficult for them to threaten a no deal. And Britain isn't ready uh, mm. for, for that sort of just-in-time manufacturing uh, I I interruption. Um, it's a, it, it didn't have to be like this. But if you think of the red lines or the lines in the sand. I mean, we're nearly there. We're, we're nearly at Liam Fox's line in the sand now. It'll be interesting to see where he goes. But, but the, the red lines that she's crossed in terms of what she promised, the election, uh, the Lancaster speech, um, uh, you know, it is quite possible that Britain will remain in the customs union uh, after the backstop. Now, if that happens and we lose uh, any um, input into future uh, le re legislation and, and directives within Europe, then I think the people who criticise the Chequers deal have every right to say, well, this is actually a worse situation than we were in before we even had the referendum. Mm. Talking about worse situations then, <clears throat> Amory, what, what is the worst case scenario? I think there have been a number of them. What, what happens in the worst case scenario? Okay, so I think most people have um, come to assume that the no-deal situation is the worst-case scenario, just because there are so many unknowns, um, because a number of people are predicting uh, kind of chaos um, across a number of sectors. So 
Um, in, in many ways, I mean, we need to just remember for a moment and go back to that point in the referendum campaign when it kind of became clear that the people who wanted to leave didn't have a plan. And I think a lot of this stems, a lot of the trouble we're in now stems from this problem. So you'll recall that um, at the time um, the British government did quite a lot of work on what it would look like to remain a member of the European Union. Very little work was done or any kind of consensus building around what it would look like if the Brits were to leave. And well, I that think was because every bureaucrat in Britain had spent time in Brussels and didn't want to leave, so nobody wanted to work on the other plan. I mean, wouldn't you? It, there's an element of truth there. Yes, absolutely, Tiki, I agree. But, you know, that's the truth. Like, we didn't... There was no plan. Mm. And then most of the architects of, of Vote Leave promptly vanished, uh, leaving other people to, in fact, implement this situation. So now we've had to sort of work through... Or the British have had to work through a series of scenarios which were not planned for, which are kind of highly unpredictable, mm. and, and now that's kind of where we're headed. I think I was the most hard, glass half full on a no deal Brexit on that panel. But now let's get a, a real expert, local perspective on Brexit. We'll bring in David Buick, who joins me live from London. David, good morning to you, sir. What are we to expect today? Good day to you, Tiki. Lovely to talk to you. We have a wonderful political correspondent over in this country called Chris Mason. Mm. And he made a classic comment yesterday when he was asked about Brexit. And he just looked at the camera and said, I haven't got a clue, and I think that applies <laughs> to pretty much everybody in this country, to be honest with you. The fact remains is that I don't think a no deal is an option, because we are wholly unprepared for it. Yeah. Had there not been this ridiculous general election on the 1st of June 2017, a no deal was highly on the cards, because there would have been a bit of power behind the throne, and the threat to the European Union is, come on, give us a proper trade deal, we'll pay the bill, and let's get on with life. That is mm. not an option now. Uh, what I do think I believe from what I've read, and let's face it, I've seen no small prints and nor has anybody else, is everybody is going to hate this. Uh, the Cabinet, will they get it through? I think they have to, because they realise that one of the big threats that you have mentioned on your programme is the threat of Jeremy Corbyn. And yes. the Conservative Party know that he would have, in this circumstances, a real chance of getting in because well, of the uh, uh, disenchantments and the division levels in the country. Yes, as, as I understand it, David, it's one thing that business will hate more than even uh, a, a Brexit that's a bad Brexit, and that is a Jeremy Corbyn government because of the threat of nationalisation, that sort of thing. And a lot of this sort of preparation for moving out of Britain, such that there is, is also in the event that Jeremy Corbyn becomes Prime Minister. That's exactly right. I mean, honestly, it's a ratio of about four to one. I've been talking to quite a lot of people in banks and fund managers. And they say, oh, no, we're over the Brexit problem. We'll, you know, we'll deal with it as it happens. But Jeremy Corbyn is a serious threat. I think the mm. problem is when you get back to the Cabinet possibly agreeing it, there may be one or two um, resignations. Andrea Leadsom could possibly, Penny Morton could probably leave, maybe one or two others. But that wouldn't be absolutely disastrous. But the Labour Party is completely split on Brexit. And the one thing they want more than anything else is a general election. Now, Keir Starmer is a, is a lawyer. He's the opposition spokesman on Brexit. And he just comes out with platitudes. And he doesn't really have any answers apart from staying in the single market. That is a no-go area, Tiki, because all you're doing if you stay permanently... The transition agreement, is, in my opinion, is going to where this all falls down. If you had an end date that at... 2021 or 2022, we're out of it, and there's no more single market, and there's no more customs union, I think we get it through. But the fact is that the European Union doesn't want to do that. And if, they, if we stay in the single market, the custom unions, you get no say in the next two years about what happens, and you do as you're told. And the great god, European Court of Justice, hangs over you like the sword of Damocles. And that is one of the major reasons that the country voted to come out of Europe is they don't want to have their jurisdiction and their laws decided by other people. Right. So, and what about the softer, well, the, the, the Irish problem? I was reading uh, Robert Peston in the, in the Spectator, and he was suggesting that maybe in all this yeah. fine print, there's the idea that Northern Ireland, you know, eventually comes out of the customs union, but has a few European free trade, uh, European trade rules there over it. Now, surely that puts a faint line between the whole of Ireland and Britain down through the Irish Sea somewhere. And what's the DUP going to make of that? 
They're not going to have it under any circumstances. Those 20 votes which um, Theresa May needs to maintain her uh, majority in Parliament will go. Yes. Uh, what I think she's doing is obviously, I think the, probably the busiest person in the world now is probably the chief whip who's running <laughs> around like a you know, headless chicken, finding out who is going to support it, not just from the Conservative Party point of view. Can they get enough Labour votes that can actually give the government or Parliament the overall majority to get this through? Mm. I think it's nip and tuck. And I think what is probably going to happen is that your the two excellent people you had commenting on it before is don't underestimate the power of the European Union and the 27 countries. Mm. Mac Macron, I was in France two weeks ago, he is desperately unpopular. Merkel is in, her back is against the wall, and they are on a crusade to save not only their own political skins, but to make sure that the dream stays in place. Mm. But one of the things I think may happen is Theresa May would may well be told, check us, this doesn't work. Come on, let's get back free trade and a Canada plus plus deal. Now, she won't like it. Ollie Robbins won't like it. So Tim Barrow won't like it. But it might just be the get out of jail card. Because to get this through the cabinet, will it happen? Probably. To get it through Parliament, I think hell's got a better chance of freezing over than that happening. So, David, are you saying that this actually will be pressure, this pressure will be put on the Prime Minister around the Cabinet, or are you saying that uh, maybe uh, you might even need the can kick down the road, i.e., you're running out of asphalt, I know, but, but, the, um, but the Article 50 uh, moved back, uh, so the March deadline moved back to allow a new type of deal, a Canada plus 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 deal, to emerge? I think, from what I gather, that Article 50, it depends on whether you're reading it from a legal interpretation. But from the government's perspective, I think it's cast in stone. As a legal document, I don't think it is. Mm. But what I'm saying is that I think that one thing is getting the Cabinet to reluctantly agree, and there will be a huge level of reluctance there. I mean, I, Liam Fox won't like this. Mm. Um, I can't see Michael Gove particularly liking it, but I mean, he'd probably go along with it. Um, and, you know, we are even hearing that Dominic Raab is not exactly over the moon, and we get the impression that she and Ollie Ob Robbins have elbowed him out of the final conversations. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. Mm. But what I'm saying is any agreement in the Cabinet will with massive reluctance. But the real den, or Andrew Cleese and the Lions' den, was when Theresa May faces Parliament. She's got yeah. a real problem on her hands. Yeah, yeah. What's the market thinking of all this, David? Because the pound's been, you know, behaving a bit wildly, I suppose. Well, basically, it's, the pound is a little bit better, but we've noticed, Tiki, that even though the markets are in turmoil, stock markets are in turmoil, the, actually the FTSE has behaved not too badly, and all right. it's done is come down in, in comfort with other uh, bourses for the simple reason that they're probably temporarily overpriced and we need a little bit of a shakeout. What I think business thinks is no deal is a no-go area, and however bad things are, you've got to get your heads back on the table to get something that is agreed. And the most important thing is the period, the two-year period from the 29th of March 2019 for two years. That transition, we must have an end date on it. And it is utterly ridiculous to say it's not possible. It mm. has to be possible. Otherwise, as I say, I think you go back to say, we can't do this, so it's a free trade and a Canada plus, plus, plus. There were rumours coming out of Barnier's office that the European Union might just have accepted that two or three months ago. Oh, really? So what would make them now turn around and, and accept a Canada uh, plus plus now? Basically, that um, whatever you hear is that, I mean, your, your uh, co colleague very eruditely said, you know, that uh, the European Union is prepared to surrender economic uh, uh, prosperity for a little bit of, you know, the dream. The fact is, they know, is that everybody could be severely damaged by this. I mean, you've got to remember, we're going in now into a cycle where there's a general belief, forget Brexit, that global growth is not cracked up what it was cracked up to be at the beginning of this year. You know, yeah. seeing signs of China not doing that well. I mean, you are a beacon ticky out there in Australia. <laughs> what is it, 23 years of growth? Fantastic. Okay. But even you must be looking over your shoulder. And this is the problem. Do you want to cut, your, cut off your nose to spite your face? Bit silly, isn't it? Yeah. David Buick, always great to get your views. Thanks so much for all of that. Terrific. Not at all.
After the break, talking today's new government SME loan and the broader issues at play affecting business investment. Dr. Adrian Blunder Wignall, next. Now, back to Tiki. Well, let's move to our final interview. What are the potential collisions that will impact business and investment in the coming years? Well, former Director of Enterprise and Financial Affairs at the OECD, based in Paris, is Professor Adrian Blundell Wignell, and he spoke today at the ASFA conference about the effects of unwinding low interest rates, the shift in globalization coming on with China's Belt and Road Initiative state of play in financial regulation and the trust deficit with financial services. He's just written quite a major book on all this. What is globalization really doing to the world economy and how might it matter for markets and asset allocations in the future? I spoke with Dr. Blundell Wignall on the sidelines at the event in Adelaide. We spoke first about the government's new SME loan fund just announced today, which had not yet officially been announced at that stage. Well, I don't know the uh, the full structure of it because it's uh, you know just uh, heard it uh, you know getting out of bed and the TV flashed across my screen for a while. But <laughs> but basically, um, you know, small business small business funding is a uh, you know is a big issue. But overall, as a general proposition, I'm in favour of equity finance because basically, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, innovation and so on, if you fund fund with you know equity, whether private or listed. Uh, then when it goes, you know, if, if the investment fails, as, as many small and medium-sized businesses do, uh, then the equity gets wiped out. When you have debt, uh, the problem there is that if you have a, uh, and I think this looks like some sort of special purpose vehicle where the government puts in some money and the private sector puts in some money, and on the other side of it there's, uh, you know, there's small business loans. I think in that kind of environment, the risk is that, um, uh, is that especially if there's some political aspect to it, that it becomes uh, uh, you know, in, in something in the form of underpricing risk, or I uh, hesitate to use the word subsidy, but underpricing of risk is never good. Uh, now, in Australia, we've had uh, you know, large, uh, probably too much, way too much debt in the household sector. Mm. The corporate sector has been fairly well behaved. Uh, uh, I guess uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really in favour of seeing it boost up too much, but having said that, I think it is a good idea, uh, you know, providing you can price risk in the appropriate way mm. to try to help the, the smaller business sector. Okay. Well, we'll be talking to the uh, finance minister as well, of course, on this. So uh, you've been uh, s slightly um, uh, under, under wraps writing this great book since you left the, the OECD, Adrian. Uh, Globalisation Finance at the Crossroads. Uh, without going back to uh, the, the, the global financial crisis itself, what do you think of the regulations and in particular Basel that have been put into, in place as a result of it and how do we go forward from here? Well, I think um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because it, you know, if you look at the United States, I'd say that they, uh, they've done quite a good job uh, with financial regulation uh, because they haven't really followed Basel uh, uh, as, as much as what the European uh, uh, and to some extent Australia have done. Basically, in the United States, they're really focused on a pure, simple leverage ratio, which they've got up to over 6%. Uh, they've got some separation in there with Volcker type rules and so on. So they've done a really good job. Uh, they, they put in liquidity. They, uh, they did all the things you have to do. They separated off the bad assets with Fannie and Freddie playing a big role there. In Europe, they just haven't done that. Uh, and of course, they favour the Basel system, which is all this risk weighting and so on. So I'd say that the world's very broken up in terms of uh, we don't have a we don't have an even regulatory system. You know, for me, if you had to pick the most basic regulatory principle, it would be that all assets and, uh, and securities and things should be treated in exactly the same way, no matter where they are geographically and no matter what form they take. Uh, and that's just not the case at the moment. And when that's not the case, the financial market can still move things around uh, and, uh, and, and create uh, unnecessary risk. So I think, uh, I think it's still an unfinished business, and it's particularly an unfinished business in Europe. Right. Where do you see the solutions? Well, I think the, um, I think the, I think the solutions are quite, are quite important because I think with regard to the financial sector, uh, we've got some huge, uh, some huge um, disruptive challenges ahead. 
and I'm not talking about banks buying, you know, little startup fintech companies and trying to sort of cope with the digital sort of world. I'm talking about the big Alibabas and, uh, uh, and Tencent and all these uh, um, uh, Google and Facebook and so on who, who basically are, uh, they, they, they have an ecosystem of the whole economy and they're into, tra into payment systems, uh, uh, banking uh, and, and so on, yet they're not regulated as banks. So I see this sector as they have artificial intelligence, they don't have all the big uh, legacy problems of the financial crisis. So I see them as a, as a big challenge to the banking system of the future. Uh, and of course, uh, I think they need to be brought into the regulatory net if they start crossing the line into being a bank. The banks, on the other hand, and particularly in Europe, are still, are still dealing with all the legacy problems. I mean, it's, it's astounding to think that here we sit, you know, over a decade after the Lehman moment, uh, here we sit uh, and we still don't have any sign of inflation. We've still got all these central banks at least the US has started to reverse it. We've got these central banks holding all this rubbish on their balance sheets uh, that were a response to the crisis. And 10 years on, it's, it's not over. Uh, and in Europe, uh, non-performing loans are, are just, if, if you're an Australian, uh, looking at the size of the non-performing loans, they're just enormous in Europe. So th they don't have enough capital because these NPLs are, are you know, bigger than the, the capital that the banks hold. So I basically see uh, uh, the need to, um, I think in, in terms of the way forward, I see the need to really to um, finish the job you know, properly, which is to deal with, the, you know, you've got to deal with the bad assets in, in Europe especially, which is a big part of the world economy, and in China, uh, where you've got all these problems in the shadow banking system that are a bit like the, uh, a bit like the crisis, uh, the, 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 the subprime crisis. Right. And you've, got to, you've got to deal with those bad, get those bad assets off and then get the banks to have enough capital to be in a, in a, in a good state. And then I think you have to start asking the question, these big, uh, you know, 10 cents, Alibabas, Googles, uh, uh, Facebooks and so on, you know, that, uh, um, um, that are, uh, Amazon, I should have mentioned, are, are really um, going to be, uh, I think, getting into the banking space and they too have to be brought into this issue. If they, if they walk like a duck and quack like a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quack yeah. Like a duck, then they are a duck. Uh, and, I, and I think that's the, uh, that, these are the big challenges that I had. So this issue's not finished and, and the big problem is every, everyone in the Basel type of world they all think, oh, well, it was such a big exercise, uh, which was, you know, very partial and very different in different regions, is, is by no means finished yet. They all have regulatory fatigue and they think the job is done. I personally don't think the job is done. So, so Adrian, one of the big challenges globally, of course, is that the European regulators, um, exhausted as they are with, with regulation, do have half an eye on regulating uh, the, the, the fangs, uh, whereas what's in it for America to regulate its big high-tech giants and what's in it for China to do the same? Well, what's in it is, um, you know, you've got the, the interest of the shareholder and, uh, and, uh, and, and the near-term sugar hit, but what's in it is, you know, to avoid, uh, you know, to avoid another financial crisis, which, mm. uh, which was devastating before. You know, we haven't even got, uh, uh, you know, bank interest rates are still negative. Can you believe this? You know, here we are 10 years later, interest rates negative. <coughs> Something like $14 trillion is being held on the balance sheets of, of central banks all around the world, uh, you know, from Europe to the United States, United Kingdom and so on. It's just massive amounts of this stuff. All of that has to be pushed back out into the private sector. And the banks are not ready, and I keep coming back to Europe, but particularly in Europe, they're not ready to reabsorb all of that stuff. So, yeah, that's, it's a huge, uh, huge issue. Right. And get, now that you're back here, Adrian, what's your reflection on, on the market here? Well, I'm just here for a couple of days. I'm uh, he heading back to Paris on Saturday. But um, the, uh, the markets here, well, you know, the Australian share market uh, uh, it's got some good aspects of it. The one thing I, I can't, you know, I can't get my mind around is how big a share of the, the, the banking system is to, uh, to the, um, you know, for the market capitalisation. It's just like four or five times bigger than in any other, any other country. So we've got resources, we've got banking, and then we've got this kind of bits in the middle, which are, uh, and I think those bits in the middle are the parts that we really have to encourage. Uh, and whether this um, small business uh, plan is, is, is big enough to do that, I, I, I don't know. But, uh, but I think it's really, really important because one thing I really want to make clear, and it's really clearly written up in, uh, uh, in the book, is that China is relentlessly pursuing this Belt and Road process, which is an infrastructure project. 
and, and, and in Central Asia, Asia, and, uh, and, in, and, and towards Russia. You know, they have as much resources of, of every type that we have here in Australia. The big thing that's benefited Australia is they didn't have the infrastructure. And so basically, as we look to the future, uh, I think um, uh, we're going to find that uh, increasingly uh, they will relocate their sources of uh, resource supply as this infrastructure gets built out. Uh, and that's in the long term not going to be good for Australia. So we have to be really thinking about what do we do uh, and how do we diversify away from these uh, resources. I think that's really perhaps the biggest, uh, the biggest issue facing, uh, facing uh, the governments in Australia, how to do that. Mm. Adrian Blundell, we're going to always great to get your views and thank you so much. My pleasure, Tiki. Thank you. And that's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, another special interview from South Australia, a couple actually, with Chair of Vanguard, Bill McNabb. See you tomorrow night live from Adelaide, 5 p.m. on Your Money, or tonight on Catch Up at 8 p.m. on Foxtel, Foxtel's Channel 604. Thanks for your company.